Welcome to another episode of Stoke Meter, and I am incredibly humbled uh, to have Jen Welter on the on this podcast, this show. Uh, if anyone knows about Jen, you will know that she is a pioneer in sports. Aside from being a very adept uh, coach, she is also she also holds a master's uh, from uh, Boston College in sports psychology, as well as a doctorate in psychology from Capella University, and she utilizes that on a daily basis. Uh, and Jen, I could go on and on and on. Welcome, and quite frankly, thank you for making the time to to visit with us. Well, I think I might be the the best known as the pint size pioneer or powerhouse because you know. Um, it's funny all the time um, because I've done big things. I'll meet people and they're like, you know, you kind of remind me of that coach, but she's a lot bigger than you. And I always make sure to have fun with that one and say, oh gosh, don't, don't compare me to her. I heard she's horrible. And they're like, oh, really? And I'm like, hey, it's, you know, Dr. Jen Walter. It's nice to meet you. So like, uh, I at least have to give them a hard time before that. Cause in my mind, or in their mind, I'm XXL, just like in mine. Um, it's just in clothes. You have to get me a small. I <laughs> love it. You, the energizer, well, not only the energizer, the commander in, in that, uh, that package right there. I love it. And one thing that I did not do in the introduction is you're the first uh, female coach in the NFL ever, ever. And you talk about breaking the glass ceiling or the sideline glass or whatever they call it nowadays. Unbelievable. And I was I was mentioning uh, in the pre-show that I was speaking with my daughters and her friends uh, this afternoon. And when I told them about the guest, they were flipping out because wait a sec, you're telling me that there, there was a girl that coached in the NFL? And they were they were so enamored with that. I mean, you're talking about these high schoolers that were so impacted by just mentioning that. And of course, they asked a lot of questions. And, and I just want to segue into some of those because they were valid. They go, how, how did she do it? How did she break into the NFL? What kind of barriers did you have to break? And, and what was it like to, to go into a very heavily well, I'll, I'll not enemy territory. They just called it being with a bunch of guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think the biggest barrier that you have to break is the mental one, right? And that's that's me personally, having never seen it. Um, so having never seen it, it wasn't like I said, oh, I want to be her one day. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I try to be visible and vocal and to set the example um, for other girls and women that there's no game you cannot play and no field you do not belong in or on. It's about access and great coaching and um, the permission to dream it so that you can set yourself up to be able to do it, right? That means setting the goals along the way and doing the same work that the guys do because um, that wasn't something that I had the opportunity to have. Um, and so it's also the mental barriers when you talk about other guys in the situation, because if they haven't seen it, they don't know to expect it or how to react to it. Um, it's the media in this situation because they don't know if it'll work and they got to talk about it. So there's, there's a lot of mental barriers at every step along the way. Um, and as the first, what makes it so challenging, I think, is at that time, you're a sample size of one. <laughs> and so, you know, it's not like people are looking at you and saying, can Jen Welcher coach these guys? Is she capable? Is she qualified? It's can a woman. And so the entire narrative surrounding women coaching in men's pro football at one time rests squarely on my shoulders. Thankfully, it's no longer the case. And there are other women who are doing it and they're doing it very well. But to me, that was the toughest thing about it, right? Because I never wanted to be first and last, meaning I was the first and I was the reason why I was also the last. <laughs> because 
you know, they said, well, we had a girl once, but, and there are so many women, it's like, it's trendy all of a sudden to say first and not last. I'm like, but do you know what that really means? Because if something had gone wrong, if we didn't do a great job and set a standard that it was possible in Arizona, then it's not possible for all these women to be there now. And so that's what is most important is that at, as the first, it is an opportunity and responsibility to ensure you are not the last. So you can't screw up and close the door so no other woman gets to go there. You can't be the reason why they don't let other women through. And then you also have to be, in my mind, and not everybody takes this, but I think you have to be visible and be vocal so that you are not just oh, well, we solved that. We had a girl or we have a girl yeah. and we're good. We have 32 teams and we have, you know, you know, 20 plus coaches on every team, but we're good. We got a girl, right? So we have to, we have to constantly look at those things. And I, and I've had people say, well, when did you decide that you would be an activist? And I'm like, Mm, yeah I don't, I don't know that I really did but it's also like your existence people have questions and you can either let them continue to have questions or you can try and be approachable and answer them and so there's a lot of things that surround it um me personally I played a lot of football and that's the start and I loved football just like anybody who goes um, and does, uh, you know, does great things in football. I followed the love of the game. I didn't start with a big goal and this is important because it didn't exist. Right. So I didn't say I want to coach in the NFL. So let me work backwards and say what the steps are. What I did is say, I love football and I'm going to step up to every challenge the game puts in my way which means I have to be good every day. And I have to look at opportunities and say, hmm, okay, all right. Uh, what, what are we gonna do, right? Whether it was the first US national team, which I got to play on and win a gold medal with Team USA in 2010, or the second in 2013, or, you know, to be the first head coach of a women's national team in 2017, right? Or to be the first woman to play men's pro football in yes. 2014. And it was playing on that team that actually I just impressed the guys as a great football person. And we were great teammates. And it was the fact that the guys weren't like, oh, this <laughs> girl, right? That the head coach was really impressed. And Wendell Davis said later, he was like, you know, I knew everything about you, but I never expected that the guys would love you like they did. And it was their response to me that encouraged him to sit me down and just talk ball and to see what this girl was like, who all the guys loved. And he starts grilling me about football and what was good with the team and what wasn't. And you know, to be perfectly clear, guys, I survived getting hit by those guys every day for a year. I went, I did way more than anybody thought possible. So I was done. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm good. I'm not, I, you know, I'm not testing fate. Uh, I did not die. So I'm pretty <laughs> good with this. Um, and, but I knew there were a lot of things wrong with the team and there were reasons why the guys weren't performing to the level that they could, right? Like there were things like, okay, well, you say you include meals for the guys, right? That's part of the contract because there's not a lot of money in indoor football. But $5 meal voucher at Arby's is not a meal for a grown-ass man. No. So they're <laughs> right? Like if you would like them to play better, then maybe you should feed them more. And I literally kind of like said, I'm going to light a match on this because I'm going to leave these guys in a better position than they were before. And I guess, you know, straight truth, no chaser, a you know, uh, appealed to Wendell because the next day he called me and said, all my defensive coordinator I could talk about is how you have to coach this football team. And I just honestly said, no, I said, what do you mean? No. And I said, no, no, women don't coach football. I'm not doing that. And he goes, not a lot of guys are going to give you this opportunity. You're taking this job. And I said, no. 
play. <laughs> and so Wendell's not really a guy that you say no to. So Wendell called me back the next day and told me about myself. He said, um, do you remember how I told you not a lot of guys were going to give you this opportunity? You were taking this job. I said, yeah. He goes, good. I took it for you or coaching <laughs> me. And by the way, you can't quit. Otherwise, the entire narrative surrounding women coaching in men's pro football will be, we had a girl once and she quit. No pressure. No, no pressure. pressure at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, right? and, and I, I, One I thing I don't important. do is quit, right? But <laughs> I wouldn't have stepped up to it, right? Because I didn't see myself that way. But I'm not a quitter. Right. So, well, and I think something to, to uh, look at as well. And first of all, I, I really appreciate you putting in perspective that the pressure that does come from being the first, because I think I never really thought about that before. Yeah. Because again, you don't want to be the last, you don't want to set the precedence for, for a future failure <laughs> or a barrier. <laughs> so, you know, but I think that the thing that but it's become that, such a trendy statement, like first and not last. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah yeah but what way does when you're like, in it that's, are that's, you that's really your reality thinking about it right and and when you say first and not last like it sounds good but have you really thought that out and have you realized that it's actually more powerful to say second third and fourth than like first caveat this and first sure. caveat that and realize that there's actually strength in numbers when you say now we have x amount of women that are doing this right. um yeah. and i i i don't wish being a first on anyone to be honest because it's hard it's a lot of pressure sure. what i really appreciate though is something you said earlier and you were pursuing something you loved. It was football. It wasn't to prove a point. It wasn't to do anything like that. So anyone that says that you're an activist or whatever, whatever, man, you were pursuing the love of something. And when I looked at some of the, the YouTube videos out there with players uh, that you were that you have a very strong rapport with, it was because you were conveying that love of the game. And it was that instantaneous bond that you created because it was purely from coming from the love of the game. And when you were talking about how they become better, it wasn't any dish on them as much as I love the game. I want to see you develop. And they got that. And it was something that I, it's very rare to see out there, whether it be corporate America, whether it be day-to-day -day neighborhood, um, whatever it might be, to be able to come from that angle of loving something so much and exuding that love so much that they can't help but be enamored and want to listen to what you have to offer. And that's what I love about all your stories is I never read anything and goes, oh man, here she comes. It was never <laughs> like that, never like that. And I think it's a testament though too is you, you were giving your first shot uh, with Bruce Arians, right? Over at the Cardinals. And um, by the way, we're both ASU grads, so I love it. I love it over there. My son's name is Tillman. I mean, I wonder. <laughs> but <laughs> with, with that, now you look at what he's done over at Tampa Bay, and now there's your second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever. And it started with you. And I can't help but think that it was because of the impression that you left on him, uh, because of that love, of that passion and everything, and understand those capabilities. I mean, What's your take on that? Um, you know, that's what you hope. If if you're a first, you hope you're not the last. And it doesn't mean that you'll always be the one to walk through every door. You also have to be very realistic about that. Like as a first, you know, you, you, I've said this to other people before. It's like, you've got to be a great fullback right. and realize that you're you're oftentimes opening holes for someone else to run through right with their own capability and their own backstory and that wow. you're you're not you're not the one who's like oh i'm the best always like you were first and like that that doesn't always mean best and that doesn't always mean right and there will be other people who have done great things and gotten there with their own greatness but like as that first person you've got to be a great fullback and you've got to take on whether it's that linebacker or d lineman so that someone else gets to hit the hole and run further 
than you did. And that's, that is the reality. And it is a hard one at times too, right? Like it is, it is not easy to not say, well, well I want to be in Arizona or I want to be in Tampa right now. I mean, that would be like, I wouldn't love the game of football if that wasn't true, right? Like, um, or missing those coaches who I was on a staff with and loving them, right? Like right, that would right. just not be the love of football or the competitive human that I am. But it also does, it means that you also look at it and you're like, you know what? There, this is a long legacy of greatness and women that are gonna do great things. And I'm honored to have been among them. Uh, that I love it. I love it. And well, and again, going back to what your impact, I was, I was speaking with a, a good buddy of mine and his daughter plays high school football and they were, they were in the weight room. I, first of all, I couldn't believe the weight she was pushing. It was amazing. <laughs> but then to see, just to see her out on the field and just being accepted by the team. And I, Looking at that, when I, I remember when I first heard girls in football with the guys, that's that, that's that's crazy. But when I look at what you did and you set the tone for everything like this, I'm wondering what are you seeing now? You have broken so many barriers. When you are coaching other other girls, other women, um, and 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 even uh, men, what are you seeing? What's the biggest paradigm shift that you've seen? Uh, as far as now that you've broken the stereotypes, you show that you belong, you show the value and everything. What's, what, what else would you have everyone know? Um, you know, there's still work to be done. Um, and, and that's true. And we have to shift it on every, every level, right? Mm -hmm. There's still a lack of storytelling when it comes to women in sports in general, right? Um, women, uh, playing men's sports, and there's still a lack of parity in football for girls and women, right? So, and and that means opportunity, right? But there are a lot more girls playing. It's not as taboo. So there, there's pluses and minuses, right? Like, um, you know, I think about Madden, for example. So I was the first female head coach in Madden, and I was in both Madden 20 and 21. And what was neat about that is though there's not yet a female head coach in reality, right. we could change that in a virtual space, which means that any girl could then be the hero of her own story and choose a female to be the heroine, right? Like, which is powerful because you couldn't do that until right. you know, I was in Madden. And oh, by the way, any of those guys who are socialized through Madden could have a female head coach and they wanted to choose my team because team shutdown had the best defense. Duh. And, <laughs> you know, it wasn't like, oh, I'm just going to play this because, you know, it's it's novelty or cool to win with a woman. It was like, no, no, that's the best defense. And then when you meet those guys, for example, on the field, um, and this is, this has been fun for me, you know, like young guys at a tournament or something. I think about like this, this boy, his name is Gav and he is the cutest kid. Right. And I was at a tournament and I was there just supporting some of the girls real low pro, like not being announced, not there for any of that. Like I just went to go watch them play ball. Right. And he looked at me and he had these great, like the big wraparound sunglasses yeah. and like, you know, this just like amazing hair. And he's actually in like a, like a champion catalog now. Right. Like, but this kid is gorgeous. Right. And he's maybe 10. I don't know. I'm bad about kids ages. Right. And he looks at me and he goes, I know who you are. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, do you? And he goes, Oh yeah. I played team shutdown all the time in that. <laughs> And I was like, oh, that's awesome. And he goes, I need a picture. And I was like, absolutely, right? And I just so happened to have some of my like Gridiron Girls t-shirts on, which have become, I don't know, like a weird cultish thing because I only used to give them out at camps. So yeah. unless you met me in person, you would not have this shirt. So it's like insiders only. Um, and I had brought some just because 
I had some extras from the camps and I hadn't been able to be out on the field because of COVID. So I was just giving them out. And I was like, you want a t-shirt? And he goes, yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> and he puts the t-shirt on and then like um, other teammates, I was like, hey, do you have a teammate or two who, you know, you might want to give them to? And he was like, <laughs> And then all of a sudden, you know, I hand these t-shirts out to this adorable kid and I've got this, like, this huddle of boys around me and they're like, coach and blah, blah, blah. And they wanted to like talk and they may not have known who I was like walking up, but the fact that Gav was so thrilled, right? And then they, and and I think it was tough on Gav because he was injured, so he wasn't getting to play. Um, which was kind of cool too, because he got his own thing. But then we had like a huddle and we're all, we're all sitting there talking and they were from a team. I think it was three, three, six in North Carolina. They had like these blue jerseys and they're all like huddled around me and we're talking and their moms and dads were like, this is crazy. And so those kinds of cultural things, I mean, you know, Gav was too young. He wouldn't have remembered me coaching for the Cardinals, but that virtual space extended the narrative and gave a different point of entry um, and helped socialize that, you know, a coach is a teacher. And so having been in Madden means that let's say they have a female, you know, who's a coach, whether it be on their flag team or their high school team or, you know, college or pro, it's not so outside of the box. We've seen it before and it helps to break some of those barriers because now it's been normalized. Like, why wouldn't you have a coach? Like I play team shutdown Mm -hmm. and um, having experienced that in real life, like, I think that's so powerful. And that's made me um, become really fascinated with the importance of storytelling. Um, you know, even when I published my book, uh, my first one, Play Big in 2017, um, it got turned down by every publisher. Um, they wow. wouldn't actually publish the book I wanted to, which I think we had titled Tackle originally. And it was much more gritty or much more just football. And they said, well, women in football doesn't sell. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, <laughs> pretty sure I was the first. So how many times have you tried? Um, But because there was no standard and because no one had tried, they couldn't predict how it would do. So they wouldn't publish it as a football book. Um, They would only publish a motivational take on my story because they liked the fact that I spoke. And so having, you know, literally gone through all of these different mental things of like wait hold on like I I didn't know this was a thing and then it's a thing um it's kind of constantly having to push and reinvent and um and hopefully again set those standards so that that the next woman who wants to you know write a book or the next time that they're making decisions on you know what these things look like they'll be easier and yet we still have a lot of storytelling Um, ways to go and we still need to see a lot more opportunities for girls and women however the good thing is that um, you know the NFL did commit um, five million dollars in partnership with Nike this last year to expand high school flag opportunities for girls so that's um, that's made major um, waves in progress Izell Reese former NFL player um, is with NFL flag and they've been you know, really doing some great things like Alabama is going to add um, the Jets added part of New Jersey. The Giants added another part. I know I worked with the Giants, so the Jets probably hate me now. But then again, <laughs> I probably could have picked off um, their quarterback the other day, too. So <laughs> <With maybe more. laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I'm just saying, right, maybe they, they should bring me into the building instead of hating me. But um I, you know, I, I mean, what can I say? Like everybody was picking them off, but, um, and then I'm working with like Matt Leinert's league to add, um, flag in California and we're doing a pilot season. So there's been, um, a lot more progress and it is varsity in states like Florida, Atlanta, um, or sorry, Georgia, Florida, Georgia, um, Alaska, Nevada, 
um, and different parts of states. So we're trying to say, as I say, 50-50 for equality. Um, and then the NAIA added girls varsity flag football last season. Oh, so nice. for the first time, yeah. So the, for the first time in the history of this sport, girls could change the trajectory of their lives and their education by playing football. So that's a, wow. that's a game changer because now you could get uh, college scholarships. And so um, the NAIA was the first to lead last year. Um, the NJCAA is adding for this coming year. And um, my prediction is that the NCAA needs to get in like yesterday. Yeah, and I, I believe that a lot of that, all, a lot of that success is gonna to lead to that. There's no doubt about that. No doubt about that. Good grief. Well, I'm, I'm wondering, you, you, had to, you had to have seen all kinds of things as you were not so much breaking into it as, as much as uh, going back to the, what we said before about the love of the game, but just wondering what were some of those difficult things that you ran into? I mean, you, you probably hear them not as much nowadays just because you, you already did it. But what are some of the things that someone's breaking into, a, whether it be a sport, a business, or whatever it might be, what are some of the things you just said, you know what, stay focused and let's, let's mow past these. Just if you, you wouldn't mind sharing some of those things. I mean, that's a day-to-day, -day, right? Like that's the day-to-day. -day. When you're doing something different, it's going to be hard all the time. And, and, and I think what makes it hard is that you don't ever just get to a point where it's easy you, the higher you go, the more you realize that there's a lot of work to be done, right? Mm -hmm. Like I said, with the, you know, whether it was with Madden, like I never would have thought of um, the esports space. And yet, um, when I was educated to that, I was like, okay, well, what do we need to do, right? Like, how do we change that? Um, I wouldn't have thought of the book as being a barrier until I was in it. And so the, the higher you go, the more you realize how much work there is. And so that's what becomes really important is that um, you keep looking how to move things forward, right? Like even with Gridiron Girls, um, so we've done, I found a Gridiron Girls four years ago um, doing flag football camps for girls. And I thought that was kind of like, duh. Right. Like, I, didn't, I mean, this doesn't seem complicated to me. It's football and girls want to play. Um, maybe the first female coach in NFL history should teach them. You're right. um, and yet I could not get support coming out. Um, it was girls don't want to play football. I'm like, you know, they've never had the opportunity to decide if they wanted to play it. And they haven't had access to coaching or right. there's already co-ed, which is fine, but when you're getting two to 4% or well, sorry, one to 2% girls at a co-ed camp because you have two to four out of 200, um, there's a problem. Yes. And those girls are fundamentally behind because they haven't been socialized the same way in the backyard as the boys have. So they're learning how to catch and throw for the first time at this camp, whereas boys have already kind of learned something, whether or not they were coached well or not. I can't, I can't say anything about that, but they do have in general an advantage. And then when the girls don't know it, the immediate go-to is, oh, she throws like a girl. That's not actually a thing. Like gender doesn't really impact your ability to throw, um, but access to coaching does. So you don't throw like a girl or a boy. You either throw like you've been coached or you haven't. And yet again, you know, we could go back to Zach and, you know, I mean, throwing four interceptions, like maybe you should have gotten thrown more. Um, it's just funny. I mean, he's wonderful and he'll be great, but like, you know, these are the things that we have to look at and, and people come from a bias standpoint that then breaks you down in your confidence and you could get, um, you know, made fun of before you ever even get made fortified with the information that you need. And so, um, you know, I start doing these camps and there was also the, well, we don't want our girls to get hurt. And I'm like, but why would they get hurt? And they're like, well, football's dangerous. And I'm like, well, this is flag. Um, and so this is your mental perception of what girls and boys can do is actually being stuck in a sport that it's not, but it was that barrier of saying football was like, Whoa! Um, and so having to like 
really be on the ground and doing the work to go from having like, you know, 40 kids to now looking at ways that we can, you know, impact 200 per city and, you know, seven per month, which is what the month of October will be. So, you know, we'll have, and, and it'll probably be less than 200 because of COVID, but like, let's just say we get a thousand girls out on the field mm -hmm. in one month, how much of a difference that is um, versus when I first started and, everybody was looking at us like we were crazy. And now I can say, but mom, your, your daughter could go to college and play this sport and she could, she could have a scholarship and it will likely be um, an Olympic sport in 2028. Why would you take that from her? And they go, oh, yeah. Well, that's different. But when we started, no one else was doing a national movement for girls in football. So all of these things that are now starting to like, people see it and they understand it. When, when I was doing it, it wasn't sexy, right? Like I had to have, I remember my first flyer. Um, I had to have um, an, illustrate, an illustrator draw me a picture of girls playing football because um, there really weren't any images anywhere. And now, I mean, you can see them everywhere. Now you could see um, some of the girls that I've worked with, uh, the Apex Predators out of Vegas. Um, one of the girls who is a love and like all of her team is, um, Kilolo was the girl who literally is saying like, who's got my back, I got your back. And they're in the pink camo. And those, those girls have been to a bunch of my gridiron girls camps and we've worked together for a while. So now you're seeing some of those girls be brought to the forefront. You saw Tony Harris in a Super Bowl commercial. You know, you see some of these different things. Um, but then just four years ago, you you couldn't play I spy and find a girl in photos. So um, mm -hmm. there's just a lot of a lot of work to continue to to be done to change um, you know, that those mental barriers and opportunity barriers as well. Yep. Yeah, matter of fact, I'm already seeing it from a flag football. And my boys played rugby as well as flag football. And in both cases, they had girls playing. And they were lighting them up. <laughs> I mean, they were lighting them up. So you hit like a girl. Yeah, she just put you down really hard, brother. And it, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing to see because what you effectively have done is you've burst assumptions and it's amazing how powerful assumption, assumptions could be when there's nothing backing it with, with exception of, well, because of something and it hasn't been proven and, and you're going out there and proving it. The, the inspiration is, is, is there of, of, of doing that. So thank you. I, I can't even thank you enough. It's, it's helped me, my boys see things in a whole different way of what people are capable of. And it's, it's, it's boys, I, I think real quick, you, you both kind of said a word. So first of all, Marie said assumption, but I think that also ties into what you said, Jen, when you said normalize, mm. what's cool is when you can turn a negative assumption into a positive normalize, norm, normalization, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And that's what the trend is. And that's, what's really exciting. And when, when you were talking about, you know, people don't throw like a girl, they've never been coached. An area or something that really came to my mind was you're seeing um, girls coming from soccer into football in like the kicking position. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and the reason is, well, they've been coached. They know how to kick. And may, in many cases, they can kick much better than their male counterparts, you know? And so I, I've never been accused of, you know, or, or you wouldn't say, well, you kick like a girl. <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> yeah. and so one of the one of the things that I think is is really cool about you is well first of all nothing in competitive sports they're not going to come and grab someone just because they want to be a trendsetter and break a glass ceiling the oh, reason that, well, let's let's be really honest like there are some places and spaces that they will yeah, but I don't think I don't think the NFL is one of them. No. <laughs> so I one of the things that's impressive about you is, you know, you have a master's, you have a doctorate, you have 
experience and what you did. You know what I mean? It was definitely not a, a token effort or a token position. No. Yeah. Tell us about tell us about some of your your credentials, the the gen cred, so to speak, because you bring a lot to the table. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, having played first and foremost was big. Um, you know, I played um, fifteen years women's tackle football. Um, in that time, I won four championships. Probably lost four too. Who knows? Um, uh, was an eight or nine time pro bowler, um, had first and second U S women's national team, um, and led team USA with a, one of my best friends. Like we literally had the same stats, uh, in 2010 Ninji Martin, and she's like a foot taller than me. So I'm, I'm good with staying like toe to toe with Ninji. Like, I think that's pretty awesome. Um, and you know, then played in the men's game. And so, um, being able to literally see the game film was really important for all the guys. Like when I, when I walked into Arizona, like all the guys were like, Oh my gosh, coach, I watched your game film. Like those dudes knew everything about me. When I walked in the door, they had done their homework. Like you guys think women talk. Oh no, dudes are way worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you guys like don't let anybody ever talk out of that one because I know it's true and I've heard it and you also compare everything so yeah um you just don't admit was, it That's yeah different. I mean but it, like I speak dude now so you're screwed um, <laughs> like I've been in the locker rooms I get it I know it now and like I'm like guys that doesn't just go away when I'm not coaching you anymore I can read you like a book um and you know and that's a funny thing too is they would be like man coach has got like that mind control but it it was literally just paying attention to the relationship aspects of stuff um because you know it a player is actually also a person and that's really important to know like if you know if one day um you know and i, I busted on poor zach today but like um you know playing against the patriots defense is really tough because they're really good and they traditionally are really good against rookie quarterbacks because they do show you things you've never seen before um but i always say when I'm working with players is like, if I've seen you do something um, nine days, right? Like, and I know what it looks like and I know what your variance is. If on the day you come in and you're not yourself, if there was no injury, um, my, my statement is gonna be, what's wrong with you? How could you possibly do that, blah, blah, blah. Nobody wants to be bad. No quarterback comes in and is like, you know what? I'm going to have a terrible day today, right? Look at Aaron <laughs> Rodgers, right? Like he did not go in um, and say, you know what? I want to have the worst day of my career today. Yeah. Right? Something is off. And so my approach would always be like, hey, are you okay? What's going on? Because I know that if your mind is elsewhere, where it's not is here. And so um, the focus on being really holistic with the people um, is important. Um, and so, I mean, like I did an interview with Mark Sanchez and he was like, yeah, everybody said you were a like a player's coach. What does that mean? And I was like, okay, if you had a really bad day, I would say like, are you okay? And he's like, oh yeah, that never happened. Right. As opposed to what's wrong with you would be like, Hey, are you okay? Like, those are two very different things. Mm -hmm. And that's why the guys would be like, it's like, she could see right through me. Well, yeah, because you've showed me that it's, you may not have told me, but you did through your play that something else is off. And so to get you to peak performance means that we have to deal with whatever's going on, not just in terms of, you know, you throwing the football or you making or missing a tackle, but what has your mind elsewhere. And so um, that's where, you know, having a master's in sports psychology, having a PhD, um, that kind of comes into play and so having that and a player um it's a unique value proposition most people have one side of the equation or another um but have not been in the roles of you know um doctor coach and player right right it's i love what you just said there though because so many people are so quick to find fault in in things 
that they forget that there's a whole human element. And I'm guilty of that. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I'm always like, why did you do, what the, instead of, hey man, what's up? And, and to, to get that heart to heart, that's that's where they they say that you have the voodoo. How does she know, right? But once you once you open it up in that, it's amazing what really starts to come out. And and that vulnerability that you display always shows the that they're op- they're willing to be vulnerable too. I mean, it's it sounds like it has no place in sports, especially something as grand as as football. But quite frankly, it's something that's probably the biggest lacking element that I've seen in, in sports, in, in, in business, whatever it might be. So, it hey. is. and you know, that old autocratic style of leadership um, is the same as like that old style of psychology. Like it's crap. We mm-hmm. don't, we don't relate to perfection. We don't, we don't need to be made feel less than we need to feel understood and related with. And I remember you know, my, I mean, my undergrad degree from BC is in business. And I remember reading those leadership books and kind of being like, (laughs) I mean, okay. Right. Like why, why would I follow you to war or why would I believe in you? And if you don't know anything about me, how can you motivate me? Right. Like if it's more motivating for me to, for example, like, get a day off than it is to get an extra dollar an hour, um, then don't try and motivate me with, with extra dollars because you're going to think I'm obstinate and it's not the case. I'm just not understood. So if you want to motivate me, you have to understand me. You have to know how I need to hear things and what it is in this world that Mm -hmm. I'm working towards because my value structure might be very different than yours. And so, um, I say any relationship, whether it be business or, um, or in sports or coaching or whatever has to be founded in trust and love. Yes. Like to be really effective, to be really good. You can do it other ways. Like there can be respect and, and, you know, that's actually my style. There are some people who just want to be left alone, or at least that's what they say. But for me, I need to trust, which you can trust, even if you don't love, I need to trust that you have my best interest at heart. I need to trust that what you give me is the best that you've got. Now, is it perfect? No, right? Like, um, you know, any coach isn't going to give you like, well, hopefully isn't going to give you like, put you in a position where like, "Ah, I'm going to set you up in a situation where you're going to miss all your tackles. Like, ah, (laughs) right. Like, um, but you know, they could have shown something different on tape. And so I gave you the best that I could. And if you execute the way I told you to, I will say that's on me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I need, right? Is like, hey, if you do this, it's my call. And I will go to war for you if you don't do it. Now, if you freestyle and you're right, I will give you a high five. But if you freestyle and you're wrong, I can't have your back because that's not what I said to do. Um, And so those are very different things. And that allows for the relationship to grow, right? Because if a player doesn't do the, if he does the right thing, but it doesn't have the hopeful outcome. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know what? I told him to do that. That's on me. Um, The long-term of our relationship will be very solid. But if I say like, what were you doing? And he's like, coach you said to do that I yeah. lost forever yeah. right yep. I mean there was a situation where I was put in a different position group to fix it um and switched positions and they had said that the group was difficult they just didn't want to listen well it turns out that the playbook was wrong Oh, they were doing the right things and they were doing the right things consistently, Mm -hmm. yet they were being yelled at for doing the wrong thing. And that's not the case. And when I went in and I was like, actually, um, they're doing exactly what it says to do here. Now, if we want to do something else, then we just got to adjust the playbook. Mm -hmm. Um, Like the players were like, 
<laughs> right? Because now, yes, they are tuned out because they're doing the right things and they're still getting yelled at, yeah. right? So why wouldn't you be like, doesn't matter what I do anyway, because you're literally doing what's in the playbook and you're still getting yelled at. So how could you possibly um, feel like changing anything or doing anything different would be right? But nobody had gone back and checked the playbook. Um, they just went with the criticism of them being in the wrong spot. And yet me coming in clean from a different position, I was like, but these mistakes are consistent. Right. It's not like somebody just said, I saw something and I widened out um, just to get a better angle on one play. And then I could be like, you yeah. don't get freestyle. <laughs> no, it was like every time we called this play, they're in a nine and not a six, right? So if you know what that means, that means like a wide nine from a defensive lineman where he's outside of the tight end as opposed to like kind of splitting the difference and, you know, like really kind of, you know, checking that tight end. And it was literally because the playbook was wrong. And as soon as I went to and said, no, no, um, they're doing this consistently because it's in the playbook wrong. Um, I had guys who would, you know, who would go to war for me because I went to war for them and I had their yeah. back in a situation where they were being criticized unjustly. So, um, you know, things like that, like um, we got to get to the root cause and as opposed to just the assumption that somebody is just wants to be difficult. Like most people don't just want to do their own thing. That's not, you know, especially not when you're getting yelled at for it. Yeah. yeah. Repeatedly. Well, Repeatedly. well the, the nice thing though, too, is it, there's a, a degree of fearlessness that comes from doing the right thing that, that, that emulates from you. There's no doubt about that. Not everyone's going to go, huh, I want, this is a playbook and the person that wrote it is probably the head coach or something like that. And that's a hard discussion yet you were willing to have that. And it was because it wasn't covering your own butt as much as it was getting the right thing and to have the right discussion to move it forward. And I, I love that about you. Well, and it just, it just, so many things are what I call like misses in communication. Mm -hmm. Not a miscommunication. Oh, I love it. It wasn't said wrong, <sighs> yeah. but what you said and what I heard missed each other we missed and That's so wow. the correction is on not saying there was fault here or there but we're not in an alignment so if we can if we can get in alignment then our communication will be better because we're no longer missing each other right wow. was what you said what i needed to hear and why are we missing right mm -hmm. sometimes that's cultural mm -hmm. right Sometimes that's regional. Sometimes that is, yes, male to female. Mm -hmm. um, but it, why are we missing? And why would say what I said um, maybe hurt your feelings? Was I not exposed to something in your personal history that would make you particularly sensitive to something? Say it was a nickname, right? That maybe I didn't know it offended you why would I? I haven't been with you your whole life. But if we can talk about it, if we can get on the same page, like my goal isn't to offend anybody. Now I am from Jersey. So sarcasm <laughs> is the way of life, right? I mean, I breathe sarcasm and I have from a very young age. But if you know me, then you know that about me. But some of it, like, I mean, I have that dry humor. So some of it could sound like I'm just a jerk. Um, <laughs> And then people who know me are like, no, no, she was kidding. And they're like, really? But she's so serious. And, I'm like, <laughs> and, I, and I remember even my players coached me up on that side. And they're like, man, coach, there are people who are terrified of you. And they're like, they don't know you're funny. And I was like, really? <laughs> oh, and I'm like, you know, okay, I guess, you know, and, and so um, showing other elements of self that maybe, um, I didn't know I could show as much like to the public when I was coaching. And yet now, because I'm not like, I'm way more open on, you know, some of those things that might make people less intimidating, i.e. like having pink hair or something like that. Like 
tends to let people know that I don't take things as seriously as they might have assumed, or at least open up a place for conversation and relationship to develop. Whether you like pink hair or not, like it's really hard to think somebody's terrifying when they have pink hair, I think. (laughs) (laughs) That's it. I'm going to dye my hair pink. That's it. Do it. it. I I think that, uh, you know, you, you take any industry or any sport, and if you bring qualified individuals to the table, whether they're male or female, I think one thing that is exciting is as a female, again, I'm, I'm, I'm treading some, some careful water here because I don't want to push any <laughs> stereotypes or anything. But at the same time is you, you are able to con- connect with people in a way that 99.9% of other coaches absolutely just cannot do. Yeah. And I, there, I don't care what anybody says, but there is a certain element of that because you are a female and what you bring to the table. And I, and I say that in the most positive way I possibly can. And I think, you know, I, I'm kind of a prime example. I'm a nurse. I work in an emergency department. It's always, you know, I was predominantly female for years and years and years. And, but it's cool to see and to hear when I have my coworkers say, Man, it's nice. It's nice that the males are now have broken into this this arena because of what you guys bring to the table. And so, kudos to you for again normalizing and normalizing at such a high level. I think it's just amazing. Do you see that at all? Do you see that as an advantage in the way that you interact with your players or the players when you did? Hundred percent. I mean, I, you know, like, um, whether it would be like, you know, telling the guys like, Hey man, I love you. Mm -hmm. Like I had, you know, one of my players and I've heard it more than once, but I'm thinking of one in particular where he was like, I was never allowed to say that like Uh. men, you know, we just didn't say that. And like, he'd be like, man, I love you coach. And you know, this same guy now has like a spoken word book. And, you know, he like, he performs and he's doing activism. And he was like, it was just not the definition of how I was taught to think of a man. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think when we open up those pathways, right, when we give permission to just interact with people differently or to think about them differently um, and to explore them, it's going to be different for everybody right? Some people will, um, you know, really relate to it and, and others may or may not, right? Like they, we may not get as close. Um, but I always say like, that's why you have a staff, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Is so that because we have different communication styles, different personalities, different special sauce, that means hopefully with all of the different personalities that we have, like on the team, Right. Everybody will feel like they have someone they can communicate with um, on different things. And so my style certainly isn't going to be the style for everyone, but do whoever is, right? Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can we say one yeah. style fits all in relationships? No, we can't. Nope. Can we say they do in the office? No, we can't. Can we say that even the kind of lawyer that we want is the same? No, we can't, right? We we want a, a bunch of different personalities and people in an environment so that when, when someone needs someone to talk to about X, they have someone to go to. Right. Um, and you know, I would see it a lot of the times, like, and I would, I would, I would laugh, right, with the guys, like, (laughs) there's a different dynamic, for example, um, when, like, you know, you have a coach, and he's, like, 6'6", and you're 6'6", and he used to play, and you used to play, and you guys get into it, and it's heated and you're like toe to toe your chest to chest your eye to eye and you're like in it you know I mean I could be there and be toe to toe and (laughs) eye to belly button we're not gonna be in it the same way so 
there's not going to be that inherent competition or machismo also. So like some of those things we can diffuse or some of those things just hit differently. Like I remember, I love Calais Campbell. Like I love big Calais. He's like, he's just this big love bug, right? Like I just, if I saw him right now, I would like run up and probably like spider monkey hug him. Um, (laughs) And he's from a huge family. His wife is amazing. And like, he was one of the first guys I met when I was in Arizona. And I like, literally, I, if you guys saw blue chips ever when it's like Shaq, please don't step on the children. Yeah. Um, Like I turn a corner and it was almost like Calais, you know, could have stepped on me. Um, (laughs) And so we, we bonded like early. Um, And I remember one day in practice, like, cause he was a captain and he always thought very deeply about leadership. Like he is a very deep guy. And so he would talk to me a lot of times about different elements. And it was like, you know, everybody's getting ready to leave camp and they mentally, they're already kind of gone. Right. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you know, coach, I really, I feel like maybe I should have like pumped him up more or I should have done this and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he was just thinking way too much. And I was like, Goliath, how dare you not lead the right way, blah, blah, blah. And he like, (laughs) (laughs) and he like looked down at me and he was like, coach. And I was like, well, Clay, you wanted everybody to get hyped up, right? Like, so we should just get in a fight. (laughs) And he was like, Coach Jen. And I was like, come on, you want to see how these guys get hyped up? You and I get into it? Come on. And it was completely joking. And he was like, Coach, I thought you were serious. (laughs) And I said, no, I'm completely not serious. But Calais, you are far too serious right now. Like, this day isn't on you. Like, they're all checked out no matter what you did as a captain they're going to be this day. So like on some days you just can't fix it. And you might just need to focus on your own game today. Cause he was so worried about them that he wasn't actually focused on what he needed to do. And me being so out of character and like pretending to like yell at him, um, actually got him out of his like serious mindset and like to just get to laughter. Um, (laughs) but I'm really glad that he knew I was kidding because he could have stepped on me. (laughs) You know, if, if there was no other testimony about how he felt about you, I was reading an article about him, and uh, there was one thing, and, and the article closed something that it goes, "Coach, I miss you," and it was Aww. it was it was about it was about you, and it, it was so, it was so cool to see that a big gigantic man like that playing football the way he does, and the gentleness that he he expressed when he was talking about you was if that was there was no other testament I needed to to understand what kind of impact that you had on that individual well I haven't seen that article but I would love to I always say that you know people would ask me how the guys felt and I always be like well I don't I don't necessarily feel like I'm the one to like say how they felt unless it was like a direct experience where I could say, you know, we talk about this or that, or I could talk about them, but I would go back and read articles because it was important. Um, And like, I know Kevin Minter, one of the things that stood out that he said is, you know, um, she made me a better player and and a person too, or she was a, a great person to have around, like things that talked about you know, understanding that it was a, about the people, not just the player. And that was something that stood out. But um, I did not read that article about Calais, but it makes me happy because he is just a wonderful human. And, you know, I mean, there are probably who who knows how many people who would misjudge him because he is ginormous, right? Like he's <laughs> six foot seven and, you know, he could step on me very easily. Um, You know, interestingly enough, another guy who really had an impact on me is Chandler Jones. And so Chandler was not with me when I was in Arizona. We missed each other. We missed each other by a season. Um, And yet I was at an event 
And, you know, of course I know who he is. He's a legend. Right, He's one of right. the best musicians, like, duh. And I'm at an event and he comes up and he's like, oh my gosh, Coach Jen, I have been dying to meet you. And I'm like, <laughs> right? Like, are you dying to meet me, right? Like, I'm dying to meet you. I wouldn't have even known to, that I could meet you, right? Like, I wouldn't want to be weird. Um, and he was like, oh my gosh. He was like, coach, can you come back? He's like, all of those guys love you so much. And like, I just, I just want you to come be my coach. And I was like. <laughs> That's awesome. That's right? so cool. Fantastic. But to know that that was the conversation when I wasn't there and wasn't their coach and that whoever it was and I still don't know he didn't say who he was like just the guys and they just love you and you know to have heard that I was like oh man that's amazing and Chandler and I are now super tight but like I never got to coach him like I ran into him at the last Pro Bowl where they were actually allowed to have like humans and like yeah. of course I saw him and he was like coach and he gives me a big <laughs> hug and everybody's like yeah she coached him and I'm like no but I didn't. <laughs> I can take zero but you did. credit. You, right? you, that's what's weird is you, you kind of did though. Right. But I'm like, I can take zero credit for what yeah. Chandler Jones does on the field. However, <laughs> if you want to give me street cred for Chandler Jones, I will take it. <laughs> you but, definitely but had an never impact. Never got to coach him. Right. Yeah. And, um, but we are, you know, if we saw each other, I know, I have no doubt it will be like that for the rest of our lives, just because there's mutual respect. And yet I never had the opportunity to directly coach him, but someone else, um, based on that third party, um, edification or credibility, um, left him with that impact of me. So just your ability to influence in, in that manner. I mean, that's a complete one-off and it was something just by word of mouth that created a, 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 a lasting relationship like this, it speaks volumes about what you've been able to accomplish uh, since you've partaken on the journey. It's, it's amazing to, to hear those types of stories. And I couldn't thank you more for, for the influence that you've had on my daughters that you've never even met and that don't even play football. Uh, and on their friends, again, this was just today for heck's sake. And I have a feeling it's going to continue. So again, I, I can't thank you enough for, for everything there. <laughs> well, and I, and I will say thank you to you guys as well, because as I say, like impact is only as important really as the ripple effects that we have, yeah. right? Coaching in the NFL and, and coaching those guys for the time that I was able to is very important. But what's so much Im more important are the ripple effects, right? The the impact it can have on your daughter, the impact that, you know, we, we talked about with Chandler Jones and, um, you know, how those relationships carry through and the influence that they have. And that means um, people like yourselves using your platform to share stories and to um, change the dynamics of conversation because, you know, if it happens in a vacuum, it's like if a tree falls in the woods, does anybody hear it? Um, we we are only as powerful as as the resonance that we create going forward and the ripple effects that impact other people in how we feel, how we coach, how we learn, how we love, all of those things. So thank you guys for sharing your platform with me. You are so awesome. And you know, I've got to ask you one question before you leave. Yeah. Who do you think is going to take it all this year? <laughs> from what um, you've seen so far it's a great question um this is definitely the best arizona cardinals team that we've seen since i was there just saying yeah. um because it is um and i love seeing kyler murray firing the way he is i mean he's just a dynamic guy and everybody needs to stop saying he's short because he makes me look you know i make him look tall so let's <laughs> throw that out there real quick <laughs> Um, and it doesn't matter if he's short as soon as he gets out of the pocket and then y'all seem to be able to stop him with that. So just saying, <laughs> um, but their defense, I mean, Chandler Jones, we spoke of him earlier. I mean, he opened up the season with five sacks, two strips, oh my and goodness. who knows what else. And, 
you know, quietly you have JJ Watt on that line, which means he's pulling attention. So, you know, you can't double both of them, which means you're going to have a shiny penny. And oh, by the way, you've got Marcus Golden to be able to come off the other side and Buda Baker to clean it up from the backside. So Cardinals look really good this year. Um, I'm excited for them. Um, that, that whole division is going to be really, really tough. Yeah. Um, you know, LA is good. I'm, I'm proud of the Dallas Cowboys for how they've come out, to be honest. Um, being a team that, you know, I played in Dallas for most of my career. I, I actually fell in love with the Cowboys. I don't know why in high school, cause I was from Florida, but right. you know, <laughs> um, and knew a lot of those guys like the old school Cowboys. So it's really good to see them back up in the conversation. It makes football way more interesting. Um, the Buccaneers and Brady are going to be hard to beat bringing everybody back. It's really going to, it's, yeah. it, it's really going to determine if father time has an impact on, on Brady It's going to be one of those things. And um, can you keep all of those personalities um, on a roster that is that stacked with talent happy um, mm-hmm. and will the TBD hold? And I know people talk about Tom Brady in Tampa Bay, but it is that Todd Bowles defense that impresses mm-hmm. me the most having coached in it. It is multiple, it is ferocious, and they are stacked with talent. That front seven is without comparison across the NFL, except for maybe the Cardinals. Um, so I love to see them. And then you'll have Kansas City as well, though they took a, took a loss to uh, Baltimore. Um, but I think that was less of a standard set. Um, and then don't be surprised if the Browns are pretty tough as well. Um, they have one of the best offensive lines in football. And so uh, Baker Baker, the commercial maker, will actually make plays and make playoffs this year. I love it. I love it. Well, thanks. And we're going we're gonna to track it. I know you're going to be pretty good, though. <laughs> well, you know, I... I tell people all the time, I, I don't watch football from the same perspective that other people do. Um, I watch it from the relational perspective. Um, and the players that I love, I want to do what to, to do well, right? Like think about Ty Matthew, who was also one of my guys and one yeah. that I was particularly close with, you know, he had two interceptions in that game. Kansas city needs defense to come up big. If honey badger was in that game, um, more and that one I forget I think it was a pick that got called back um doesn't go the other way that that game against Tampa last year isn't the same um because he is magic he influences everybody around him and if the game wasn't so uh tough on him that defense goes a different way so um you saw him early doing damage to Baltimore um Baltimore just seemed to have a little bit more magic that day um, and Harborough actually let their quarterback be himself. Um, he didn't flip out when he, you know, when he flipped into the end zone, which he could have gotten chewed out for. And he put the ball in his hands when a, you know, a fourth down was on the line. And that really shows a lot of confidence. But Ty Matthew, one of the very best in the game. And so when I watch games, I don't just watch from a, I love this logo. I watch from, I love these people and the people that I love and care about, I will pull for in every game. Um, And so every time I watch, that's what I'm thinking about is like the people that are playing, like I can watch any football game and get into it and, um, you know, enjoy it. But like the teams that I I really want to pull for are the ones that I have connections to. Love it. I love it. Jen, thank you for the, for those, uh, prognostications. I love it. <laughs> you are very welcome. We'll do it again, okay? <laughs> you guys. All right.